Today on the Missions Podcast, what's happening in Myanmar and how does it affect missions? My first response, and I think the response of most people, is Lord, cause this military coup to fail, defeat the oppressors, peace and order. But, you know, there's this passage in Ecclesiastes where Solomon says there's a time for peace and a time for war. We don't know what time it is in Myanmar on God's calendar. Perhaps this is God bringing situations into the lives of the people in Burma that will cause them to seek him. John with Live Global joins us today on the show. But first, a word from ABWE President Paul Davis. ABWE missionaries are coming beside the lost and the hurting around the world. And through the Global Gospel Fund, they're pulling people from the darkness and training them as leaders. They're planting churches, and they're even beginning their own missions movements. You may already support one ABWE missionary. Would you consider a gift to the Global Gospel Fund to support all 1,000 of our missionaries? Thank you for that. Become a partner today at abwe.org slash global gospel fund. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Advancement and Communications for ABWE International, joined by Scott Dunford, West Coast Advancement Coordinator and Lead Church Planter for Redeemer Church in Fremont, California. Thank you all for loyally listening to the show. And as we get diving in today, please remember to share. Please remember to leave us a positive rating in your podcast platform of choice. Also, we've been throwing some more clips and content out there daily now on social media. And so make sure you follow Missions Podcast on the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitters today, all those sorts of things. Scott, I wanted to get some of that out of the way before we dive in, because there's a serious topic happening here for those of us who uh, follow the news to varying degrees. I first heard about the situation in Myanmar, actually, from one of the uh, political podcasts that I uh, listened to. And, and I'll be honest with you. When I first heard about uh, some of the military conflicts happening there, my mind just immediately goes to, oh, no, not another war. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that that's really where my mind goes. And um, it, just all the foreign entanglements, I think wherever you stand on some of those issues, you know, it's it's never anything to celebrate or rejoice in. Um, Scott, you've been following it a little bit more closely. I, I think it's it's time that we discuss that as a podcast on missions because uh, it is relevant when we're talking about the spread of the gospel among the least reached in the world. Well, I mean, and it, it does hit even in America. I mean, I've got a lady in my church who's from Burma. And uh, we have another, uh, the brother of a young man uh, who's a member of our church just you know, moved to Indiana to work with a Burmese church. I have friends that work in, there's, there are actually a lot of Burmese Christians in, in the United States. And uh, even though, you know, Burma is not high on our, our news, I, I say Burma, you say Myanmar, it'll always be Burma to me. But, uh, but, you know, <laughs> we're talking about the same country, um, Myanmar. Right. And uh, as has been known more recently, Burma more historically, and there's, reasons for that, that maybe we won't get into today, but, uh, but yeah, so it, it is a relevant discussion, but it, it is hard when we get into like geopolitical things and we wonder how does it affect the church? How does it affect evangelism? I know we talked a little right. bit about this, uh, maybe over a, just over a year ago, actually, no, it was like almost two and a half years ago, um, with the Rohingya crisis. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that was from a whole different perspective at how it affected one particular, uh, how it was going on in Myanmar was affecting one particular, uh, unreached people group. But, um, anyway, yeah, certainly a lot to dive into and you and I, unfortunately are not experts on this topic. And so we no. have a expert with us today. Alex, do you want to introduce our guest? We are excited to have back on today's program, John from Live Global. Live Global is the arm of ABWE's ministry that is focused on ministering not, not directly through uh, traditional missionaries who go and who learn language and culture and do those sorts of very important things, but uh, in places where there's already thriving communities of national believers, indigenous missionaries doing hard work in hard places, building partnerships with them and connecting them with the resources of the North American church. And that's what John does. He has uh, been on this show before, and we will feature that in the show notes. John, tell us, remind us who you are and about your connections with ministry in Myanmar. Uh, well, I've been a missionary with ABWE for 20 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was a lawyer for 20 years. 
Uh, my first acquaintance with Asia began in 1969 when I was a soldier in the U.S. Army there. My first acquaintance mm. with uh, Myanmar or Burma is back in 2003. I made my first visit there for a couple of weeks. Uh, spent, I think, if I recall correctly, pretty much all the time in, in Yangon, which is uh, the biggest city in Myanmar. And since that time, my wife and I have been back there probably 12 to 15 times uh, facilitating partnerships, which we've established with nationals there uh, pretty much all over the country now. Yeah. So, you know, when we think about about Myanmar and certainly we think about Burma, those of us who love missions history, the name that we think about probably preeminently among them is Adoniram Judson. He wasn't the first missionary, first Protestant missionary to Burma, um, but was, um, you know, was a uh, the early and early when he followed followed Felix Carey and some of the others that came out of the mission in Calcutta, um, but but he he came to Burma uh, in around 1812 uh, began ministering. He, he started started out with a goal of planting one church, translating the Bible uh, into uh, I think it was the Korean language, and uh, and um, and and seeing one church started and, uh, and with, with a hundred believers, that was his goal. By the time he died, he saw not only the Bible translated, he, he was most of the way through an English Burmese dictionary. He had planted over a hundred churches and over 8,000 believers. And we really see, you know, through, through his ministry and the ministry of those who followed after him and his legacy. And I say him and his wives were a huge part of his ministry. And a lot has been written, especially on, on, on Ann Judson, some of her correspondence. I want to make sure we give her due credit. Um, and, and, and all of these, the women that were working with him, but they left a legacy behind them of, of real growth. And so there's a lot going on, um, there in, in relatively, you know, distant past there, but you, you're working with a people group. What can you tell me about, uh, what you've learned and, and seen going on, uh, in the church and how did you, how did the church kind of get to this point amongst the people group you're working with? Um, the, the part of the church that I'm working with now is, uh, a break off from a, a movement that, uh, became liberal in the 1970s. It was associated with the American Baptist church. And there was a movement to uh, get back to the Bible, to rely upon the word away from this works righteousness where the, the movement had been going. And so there was a, uh, a split there in the 70s and uh, it developed into uh, several hundred churches now um, all over the, the country of Burma. And it's uh, truly Bible-based, truly Berean, Acts 17, 11, and 12. I mean, you have to, uh, you, you teach the people there that look into the Word and to see if these things be true. Um, it's, uh, it's got a, a very um, powerful and um, living movement in missions right now. And uh, with an emphasis on reaching the unreached people groups of Myanmar. Now, Myanmar probably has, I think it's over 125 different people groups and or languages. And um, the, the big, biggest one, of course, is the Burmese. And depending upon the, um, that the Burmese tribe, depending upon the organization or the statistics that you would consult, the, the percentage of Burmese believed to be uh, evangelical or Christian adherent or born again, what, whatever the name that is used, uh, varies from well less than 1% to just, you know, 2%. Um, and the unreached people groups, of course, are much lower. And that's, those are the groups that uh, I am concentrating on with uh, the missions uh, division of this particular uh, church movement in Myanmar. Um, some of the groups that we're working with now uh, it, Joshua Project lists them as 0% Christian adherent. And the definition of Christian adherent is basically, and it says this right, right on the Joshua Project website, is basically anybody who says they're Christian, um, regardless of right. the evident state of commitment. Um, and, and if the parents say we're Christians, then they include all the children in that. And um, it's many of these people groups are under one percent under 0.5 percent um some are as low as 
a big one, a big one that what we work with is 0.02%, which is two out of 10,000 people professing to be Christians. So it's, mm. um, it's very exciting to be involved with these people because um, Romans chapter 15, as you know, Paul said, I, I want to reach those who have never heard. And th- it's right. crucial that we reach those who have never heard, both here in America and around the world and in Burma and Myanmar, because as Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe in me, trust in me is what that means. You will die in your sins. And these people, right. they don't have the Bible translated into their mother tongue yet. Um, so they're highly unlikely that they would read, desire to read about what they would consider a foreign god unless it was in their own mother tongue. They're not going to read a majority, mm. in a majority language, which is, would be considered a oppressor. Mm. Well, I, I want to get into what is the current political situation, but for those who might not have background knowledge, so we're talking about a Buddhist country, and I have a question about the religious makeup. You, you say that, you know, in some people groups and pockets, you're looking at, only 0.2% or 0.02% professing believers. But do you feel as though, you know, it, does being a professing believer in a context like that mean more, right? So are you less likely to just profess, but actually just only be some sort of external nominal Christian going through the motions? You know, do we, do we put more weight in the fact that somebody professes the faith in that kind of a context versus in the United States where you have a large number of professing believers and a lot fewer actual practitioners? Well, perhaps you ra- you raise a good point there. Um, however, The people that I work with are constantly telling me that we've gone into a village today where nobody's ever heard the name of Jesus. Nobody's ever heard the gospel Mm. before. I I hear that in virtually every report. And um, if, if 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 we can judge it all by what's happening, say, here in America, um, people who profess to be Christians, once you examine them, you find out they they often are not and have really no idea what it means to be a Christian. But you raise a good point. So explain to us what's happening on the ground there politically. Um, there's there's tor- turmoil, there's unrest. I think there's this one video going around uh, that was viral a, a few weeks ago now of a woman outside doing yoga. And meanwhile, there's you know tanks rolling through the street or some sort of progression of soldiers or military action. I forget exactly. And, and of course, you have this weird disjunction of life going on normally and, hmm. and people being apathetic while at the same time, um, complete unrest. What, what exactly is helping help us understand? Okay. Let, let's go over the background. Uh, after world war two, pretty much since after the world war two, probably, probably around 1952, the military has basically ruled, uh, Burma ever since that time up to around 2015. Uh, in order to keep their power okay. in 1988, uh, the people rose up in 1988, but in order to keep their power, the military killed in excess of 3,000 people on the streets. So it's a very cruel, uh, self-centered, vicious regime that is ruling Burma right now. Um, in 2011 and 12, there began to be a loosening up of that. There were elections in, I think, 2015. Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of the man who's considered the the head of the democracy movement in Burma, Aung San, Aung San Suu Kyi was elected president. Well, not elected president. She she was associated with the the party that won the election, and the military wouldn't let her be president, so she had to have. Uh, a lower position, but she's the titular head of the party. So she basically became the leader of the country. Subject, however, to the military's maintaining a position in the, that the, was put in the Constitution that they kept 25% of the seats in Parliament. And if anybody was going to do anything, uh, it would have to have the military's approval because they had 25% of the seats. Apparently, in this this past fall, the the democracy movement, Aung San Suu Kyi's movement, won an overwhelming victory at the polls. Uh, what I've read, people say, eighty five to ninety percent of the votes, and the parliament un- was about to take effect three weeks ago, uh, with 
90% of the vote, Aung San Suu Kyi could do anything, just even over the military's objection. So before the legislature could convene, the military took over. It, it appears they misanticipated the reaction of the people because since that time, and you know, I'm not there all, but I do get reports every morning from several of our partners as soon as the internet is opened up. I get reports from several of our partners that um, it appears that 90, vir virtually everybody on the streets everywhere is protesting the military. It seems to be well over 90% mm. of the people. And the other 10% are probably sick or too busy to, you know, they're at work or something like that. But it does seem to be that there's a, a movement which has encompassed civil servants, hospital employees, doctors, nurses, uh, export, import people, and even there's instances of a few military defecting, few police defecting to the democracy side. The political situation is, uh, it's a very, very dangerous one. And just to show you how dangerous it is to government, and I have several sources from this, and including, I think, a BBC article, uh, the government let 20,000 hardened criminals out of prison and has hired at least a portion of them to be used to counter the demonstrations in in the cities of in towns of Myanmar. And there's been instances of well-documented, well-confirmed, these hoodlums uh, going into villages at night, starting fires, uh, accompanying police, kidnapping people, terrorizing the population. And I even got photographs this morning of uh, people, these part, part of these people hired by the government, at least that's the allegation and it seems to be confirmed, uh, going into these demonstrations and stabbing people. I've got photographs of people being stabbed mm. um, in order to try to break up these demonstrations. The biggest- mm. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really terrible. <laughs> and the, one of their biggest fears of the, of the, the democracy movement people is that China is backing uh, silently, of course, they're not proclaiming it. China, China is backing the, the military. China, as you know, has this thing called the Belt and Road Initiative. They're trying to uh, just, it's, it's, a, it's a way of increasing their economic power uh, from building a road from the east all the way to Jerusalem, to the Mediterranean Sea, called the Belt and Road Initiative. And a major portion of that is runs through Myanmar because of oil and gas interests. And of course, it gives them quick access to the uh, to the sea and the Indian Ocean, which they need to be able to patrol to counter the uh, naval forces of India. So Myanmar mm. is, is understandably important in the in the point of view of China. And China has a very bad record in in caring about human rights. It's appalling. And uh, so there's no reason to believe that China is going to be backing off of this soon. They're, they have every interest in maintaining right. a government there that will be friendly to them. Before we go to break, uh, what is it like for a missionary to try to get into Myanmar? Is it completely closed off? Is it restricted in that way, like some other countries like China that you made reference to? Oh, yes. You you can't get a missionary visa to go right. into, into Burma or Myanmar. It's, it, it's, like, it's like China and it's like apparently Hong Kong now uh, with... Um, I forget the name of the uh, uh, it's Chan who got denied a visa in Hong Kong. Um, so you, if you're going to go in there, you have to go in as an English teacher, a business person, some alternative platform like that. Right. Well, there's a lot to talk about here as far as how it affects the church. We're going to explore that more with our guest, John, with Live Global right after this short break. Have you ever been approached by a student expressing a missionary call? For the last 15 years, Spurgeon College's Fusion program has been equipping students for missions through life-on-life -life discipleship, college coursework, and intensely practical training. If you know a student desiring to become a missionary, send them to Fusion at Spurgeon College as their next step. To learn more about how we are equipping students for a lifetime, visit SpurgeonCollege.com slash fusion.
Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards and an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention. And this June, attend the National Conference. Go to abuseprevention.org and register with ABWE21 as the promo code to receive 20% off your ticket. That's promo code ABWE21 to receive 20% off. Brooks Buser, president of Radius International. I am here with Mark Dever, senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist and president of Nine Marks. When you go to a culture that's a different language than yours, you're ending up in a kind of majority language that's been reached and there are other people still more hidden, and it's those people who are often almost entirely unreached, and they take more cross-cultural effort. Is there a way we can better train people to have more realistic expectations of what life is like in the kind of two steps away from my culture, and be able to sustain family life with its normal difficulties there, so that there can be a long years and even decades long witness in that culture. And it seems like Radius is set up to provide that training. Radius is about reaching unreached people groups. Go to radiusinternational.org, radiusinternational.org. We're back with John of Live Global talking about what's happening in Myanmar and how it affects the work of mission there. Uh, You just heard from our sponsors, and I just spoke, actually, with our friend Jeff, who is with the Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention that you heard about during the break. And they, um, as of March, are going to be putting out some guidelines and standards for churches and ministries to just do a do a health check and assessment and see how are we doing in the area of, of preventing some of these awful things from happening in our own midst. And uh, that's something we always want to be thinking about, right? With various Christian leaders Mm. in the news and yes, horrible moral failings. Uh, So we wanted to uh, make note of that, but we've got another equally weighty topic to dive back into. And uh, Scott, I'll let you take the next one because I've been doing a lot of the talking here. I'm just, I'm just asking questions because I I don't know a lot about Myanmar, uh, but Scott, you've spent more time in Asia. And so um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you pick John's brain next. Yeah, no, I know. I have not spent time here, so I'm, I'm, I'm fast, equally fascinated. So, you know, in a little bit of the reading I've done, you know, there has been, you know, I don't know if it's minority oppression or if it was tied into the actual religion. Um, you know, certainly we've already talked about the Rohingya, um, what an operation world that talks about, uh, the fact there has been, you know, persecution and, um, and, uh, just violence against the different uh, minority peoples. Uh, you know, you had already mentioned, you know, Bur- Burma is 80% Buddhist. Um, but the question is, how, how is all this political turmoil, how is it affecting the Christians that you know? Uh, how is it affecting the Christian church broadly, if, if you can address that? So far, the, the, the crackdowns by the military, probably the biggest thing is curfews and effect on market prices. Almost overnight, the prices of everything went up, of course, because people became scared. Uh, the The economy could end up collapsing because of all of this. Uh, and we've been asked for emergency food aid already as a result of this. But churches are still meeting on, on Sundays. Uh, sometimes, there, I mean, there are some areas where they can't. Uh, but more often than not, that's just because of lingering COVID reg, uh, regulations instead of just a, an immediate effect of the military. The military is more focused on the street demonstrations than they are on churches gathering. Um, 
having having said that, I I, I think if it continues, you're going to it, it it'll get worse because then they're going to be looking. The military will be looking for enemies, uh, looking for foreign influence. And one way you do find foreign influences with the is with the churches in 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 Burma, uh, Myanmar. Uh, you've had that for 200 years, as you mentioned earlier, with Adoniram Judson. It started there. So what is the state of the church currently, uh, or how are they surviving those difficulties? Well, they're surviving the same way they were. It's only been three weeks into the revel, into this uh, coup right now. Uh, immediately, the the effects were, uh, you, you can't, banks are closed. Uh, the internet uh, only functions uh, for a few hours a day whenever the government allows it. Uh, I, I noticed that Facebook just shut down the uh, Facebook platforms of all the leaders of the coup, the generals and things, so they can't they can't be uh, using Facebook to communicate their terrorizing messages to the people. It's uh, it's a little bit of a pretty much of an unknown right now, um, other than the the immediate dangers uh, caused by the, all this turmoil, the the blockades in the streets. The big demonstrations, uh, yes, they're good for demonstrating against the coup, but they're not good for the economy. They stop people in trucks from getting food from the rural areas into the urban areas, et cetera. Nothing is uh, coming in. The airports are closed. Uh, it's it's presenting all of those kind of problems. Um, but it's not it's not stopping the, the, the word from going forth. The people are in the churches that I'm dealing with, the word is still being preached. The pastors are still making visits, although they have to be, in many cases, much more careful now, uh, simply because the military and the police are more watchful um, and because of these thugs in the streets. Unfortunately, several of our partners reported that they, because the villages and their particular city blocks are, are very close to police stations and the police are letting these criminals into the streets and indeed inciting these criminals into the streets there has to be community watch organizations called and one of our one of our partners there has to be up from like two to five every morning because that's his duty to participate in this watch team to make sure that Wow. Nobody comes in and tries to burn down the houses. It's hard for us to hear that. And uh, it, it just reminds us, you know, that that uh, even even governments that aren't perfect um, are, are ordained by God. And when you yeah. have a government that's actually attacking its people, um, what a horrible, horrible thing. And, and so, yeah, we certainly can be praying about that. Can you can you share any stories? And I realize you probably need to protect names of people. But are there any specific stories that you could share with us about ways that the gospel is going forward uh, despite uh, some of these ongoing challenges? Yes, I can. In one particular state, there's 15 states in Myanmar. One of those states is, well, I don't want to name, I don't want to name it, but we're working heavily in one of those states where there's a uh, many different unreached people groups. And predominantly, the evangelistic effort is is through this little booklet that I, I wrote called The Ancient Path, which very simply in just 15, 20 pages answers the biggest objection to Christianity in Myanmar and all of Asia. And that is that it's it's a Western. Which we've talked about on this show. If you want to go back and listen to that episode and learn out more about that. Yes. So um, I cause just got reports in the last couple of weeks of some people coming to Christ because they were given the ancient path and that got them, although they rejected it the first time they read it, but they began to think about it. And finally they contacted the person who had given them a copy of the ancient path and they started asking questions. And uh, one particular testimony I remember was very, very interesting because it, then he said he didn't believe what the, what the person had said in response to his question, who he went to the ask the question. He didn't believe it at first, but got angry, but then got thinking about it again and then decided that this makes a lot of sense and then started having some uh, regular Bible studies. And within the past two weeks, uh, this this person got saved and um, and his, his wife also. Now, to give you an idea of what's still going on, because none of this, none of this 
None of this stops because of the coup. God's word, once planted in the heart, continues despite coup, despite earthquake, despite divorce, everything else. It continues in the heart. We we had reports of uh, one particular people group. It's uh, about two percent minus or point two percent Christian adherent. Uh, no Bible translation yet. Not even a New Testament yet. But they do have the ancient path translated at for about a year now. And this one gentleman who had tuberculosis was given a copy of the ancient path, responded immediately to it, wanted to know more, and got saved in in August. Proceeded to lead his wife to Christ also. And the wife had three sisters. Those three sisters got saved. And those three sisters had three husbands, and those three husbands all got saved. This this man's tuberculosis became so bad that we had to we were asked to help with getting him a portable oxygen uh, supply, and we did that, but it came too late. But this person uh, went to be with the Lord just three days ago, and mm-hmm. I I mm-hmm. got some pictures of the funeral and and it was a celebration funeral which would is something is totally yeah. unknown yeah. in the buddhist world because there's nothing to celebrate when somebody dies in the buddhist world wow wow so god is at work um how, how would you encourage christians to pray that's number one and then number two are there ways uh, for believers here that are listening to get involved uh, on Live Global's website, uh, Live Global, the the ministry of ABWE focused on national partnerships. Um, there's multiple projects that are designed to bless uh, different believers and ministries in Myanmar. So, how can we pray, and 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 what can we do? Okay, how to pray is is a very complicated question, actually. My first response, and I think the response of most people, is Lord, uh, cause this. This, this military coup to fail, uh, defeat the oppressors, uh, return your people to the peace and, and order to the extent they had peace and order before this. But, you know, there's this passage in Ecclesiastes chapter three where uh, Solomon says things to the effect of uh, there's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. There's a time to weep and there's a, a time to be joyful um, there's a time for peace and a time for war. We we don't know what time it is in Myanmar mm. on God's calendar. Mm. We don't know what God is doing. We honestly can say I, we don't know. Uh, I have a I have a, uh, a prayer request from one of the leaders of the church movement uh, that we work with, and basically what he was saying is. You know, perhaps this is God's way of bringing situations into the lives of the people in Burma that will cause him them to seek him. So the bottom line is we we, we know that God said in, in Isaiah 45, 22, look, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth and be saved. We know that God is not willing that any should perish, but it all should come to repentance. I think we're very, very safe to pray, God, use these circumstances until the time that you want to make these circumstances go away. Use these circumstances to cause the word to advance in Myanmar, to cause hearts to be open to you, to cause people to seek you, and because, and, and to enable so that the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust and other things don't choke the word. Cause, cause the people of Myanmar to seek you mm-hmm. through these circumstances. That's, that would be my suggestion mm. on how to pray. That's a way to pray for our own nation too. I mean, you know, we, we pray for peace. We pray for um, ease <laughs> and that's not a biblical prayer. We ought to pray that God would do whatever is necessary to, to bring about revival and, and gospel faith that leads to, to culture change. Right, Scott? Yeah. And, and I wonder, you know, as we close here, could you do a couple of things for us? One, what are some resources that people, where, where do you go to find your news about things that are happening in, in Myanmar? Um, how do you keep track of that? That if people want to follow along in the news and pray, you know, effectively and, um, and just keep track of those things. And then, and then secondly, how can people get in, get in touch with you? How can they support you? How can they find out more about your ministry or, or maybe even get involved, um, in a more tangible way in, uh, the ministry going on, um, in Myanmar? 
The the best source for what we have uh, for what is happening on the ground there is, is of course our partners and friends who are on the ground there who give us personal uh, recollections of what they've seen and and what's happening and, and could tell us firsthand. Uh, a really good public uh, source is Irrawaddy.com. It's a it's a newspaper a news outlet that's I R R A W A D D Y. Dot com uh, and they have reports I mean obviously it's a Burmese based uh, organization although it may in fact be based in Bangkok I don't know uh, but it's very very good for what's actually happening uh, on the ground and it's um, it's not influenced at all by the military as far as I can see uh, as far as contacting me you could contact just contact ABWE uh, and ask for my contact information, Bill, and just say you heard heard this on the podcast, and uh, in a secure fashion, they'll make sure that the inquiry is for real, and and then I'll be able to respond. Mm, absolutely. And if you want to reach John, email Alex at missionspodcast dot com. John, thanks for joining us today, and uh, also follow the link in the show notes to learn more about Live Global, the ways that you can support partners in Myanmar. Uh, to get more of this show, go to missionspodcast.com. And while you're there, be sure to share the show and leave a positive rating and review in your podcast app of choice. And until next week, thank you for joining us.